Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Hormel food stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Hormel was founded in 1891 in Minnesota by George Hormel. Originally, it focused on the packaging and selling of ham, spam, sausage, and other pork, chicken, beef, and lamb products directly to consumers. By the 1980s, Hormel began offering a wider range of packaged and refrigerated foods. In 1993, the company changed its name to Hormel Foods. The company sells its products in over 80 countries with brands such as Applegate, Columbus Craft Meats, Dinty Moore, Jenny O, and Skippy. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 25 billion market cap. They're trading at $47 a share, and they have 540 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future, and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see the company has positive and pretty consistent free cash flow each year. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And they also have positive and consistent net income each year. The easiest way to value a company is if they have consistent numbers. It doesn't matter if the numbers are good or bad as long as they are consistent then it's easy to figure out the future. This is the revenue, their sales, and it does go up a little bit from 9.2 billion up to 9.6 billion. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Examples are cost of the meat products and cost of labor. The difference between those two numbers is their gross profit. The company's gross profit goes down each year a little bit from 2 billion down to 1.8 billion. Below that is their operating expenses. Examples are marketing, insurance, and depreciation. Then below that is operating income, and that's also decreasing each year. It goes from 1.2 billion to little over 1 billion. Below that is the interest they receive on their investments minus the interest they pay in their debt. Below that is other income and expenses. This is usually impairments or other non-operational gains and losses. Then you have your pre-tax income, then your taxes. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income. And that's pretty consistent each year. It was the lowest in 2017 due to high taxes. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. Then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. When a company wants to buy a new warehouse to start manufacturing meat products, the cost of that warehouse goes into CapEx the year they purchased it. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. Free cash flow is the cash that's remaining to pay a dividend, which this company does. It's also the cash that's remaining to pay down debt, which they do, and to buy back stock, which they also do. And also free cash flow is used to grow the business, which of course this company does as well. In 2017, the company issued 280 million of debt and paid 280 million of debt. So that's a wash. In 2018, they issued 375 million. In 2019, they paid 375 million. So that's a wash but they did issue a lot of debt in 2020 without paying down debt. They may have been using this debt to acquire another business. There are two ways to reward shareholders, pay a dividend or to buy back stock. This company does both. They bought back 95 million of stock in 2017, the next year 47 million, then 174 million, then 12 million. When a company buys back stock, this decreases the shares outstanding which makes your shares more valuable. The most important part of any business is their operating cash flow. If you cannot generate positive, healthy operating cash flow, you don't have much of a business. 
And this company generates lots of operating cash flow, about $1 billion every year. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit and loss. It's not actual cash. And the way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with net income, then you have to add or subtract the non-cash items on the income statement. They pass through a $205 million depreciation expense that brings down your net income, but we have to add it back here on the statement of cash flows. They also had 32 million of deferred taxes, 22 million of stock-based compensation, and negative 29 million in changes in working capital. This is changes in accounts payable, accounts receivable, inventory, things like that. So even though the company reported a $900 million profit, they actually generated over $1.1 billion of operating cash flow. That's why I feel operating cash flow is a better indicator of a company's health than net income. Let's look at the capital structure. 6.4 billion of equity, 1.3 billion of debt. They're 83% equity, 17% debt. Their net debt is negative 428 million. So that means they could pay off all the debt with the cash on their balance sheet and still have 428 million of cash left over. Their WAC is 6.2%. And that's the discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 23 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $21 billion. We divide that by 540 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $39. They're trading at $47, so they're trading at a 22% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Simply, Wall Street values the company at $53, so they're saying it's undervalued. They're saying it's a buy. This is the stock price the last five years. It looks like it dropped a lot from 2016 to 2017, but since then, it's only gone up. It did drop a little the past few months. It seemed to really peak in the midst of coronavirus. Probably sales were really strong for this company. And this company raises its dividend each year from 15 cents up to 25 cents. And they pay a 2.1% dividend yield. The way you calculate dividend yield is you could sum up the last four dividend payments and then take that number and divide by the current stock price. They pay out 58% of their net income and 70% of their free cash flow. And this company has raised its dividend for 53 consecutive years. So if you own the stock and you're in for the dividend, I don't think you have much to worry about. And the average dividend for consumer staple stock is 1.73%. They're a little higher than that at 2.08. And the average dividend for consumer product is 0.51%. They're much higher than that. This company has a negative beta, negative 0.05. A negative beta indicates the stock moves opposite the market. The stock has gone up 5.7% in the past 52 weeks, which is worse than S&P 500, which went up 17% in the same time frame. The 52-week low was 39, the high was 53. The stock is trading above its 50-day, but below its 200-day moving average. When the 200-day moving average moves above the 50-day moving average. That's called the death cross. That's a bearish signal. About 3 million shares are traded each day on this stock. And of the 540 million shares outstanding, only 281 million are on float. 45% are held by institutions. And almost 7% of the shares on float are shorted. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you would have quadrupled your money over $41,000 today. The reason the company has such a low float is because nearly half the shares are held by the company's endowment fund. Vanguard owns 6%, then BlackRock, then State Street, then Capital Research. Let's look at their financial ratios. The average PE in the market's nine, the median is 14. PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They're at 28, so investors are paying $28 for $1 of earnings. Price to sales is stock price over sales per share. They're at 2.6. That's a really good price to sales ratio. 
Price to book is stock price over book value per share. They're at 4.0, which is between the median and average. And the way you calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is assets minus liabilities in the balance sheet, and they have 6.4 billion of equity, 2.7 billion of tangible equity, because they have 3.7 billion of intangibles on their balance sheet. The only way a company can get an intangible asset on their balance sheet is when they acquire another company or merge with another company. You can internally generate an intangible asset, but you cannot put it on your balance sheet. Interest coverage ratios EBIT over interest expense. They can easily cover their interest payments. ROE is net income over equity. They have a good ROE at 14%. Current ratios, current assets over current liabilities. They can cover their current liabilities almost two and a half times. And their current assets are 1.7 billion of cash, 700 million of receivables, and 1 billion of inventory. So the company does seem to be well capitalized. They had over 700 million of free cash flow, 2 billion of working capital, and they pay out half a billion in dividend payments. So they have 2.3 billion of funding. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos on Beyond Meat, Conagra, General Mills, Kellogg, Kraft, and Simply Good. All in the same industry as Hormel, and if Hormel has a number in green, they're better than the average. If they have a number in red, they're worse than the average. So they're better in all the price multiples, a lot better. They do have a high current ratio. It is below average because Beyond Meat's current ratio is through the roof. They're a little higher in ROE. They're a lot lower in debt. They're a little bigger in market cap. They do pay a small dividend than average. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 22% premium. This company has been around so long, it's one of those stocks you can hold on forever, and I don't think there's too much risk to it, plus you're guaranteed a dividend payment. I rank their free cash flow 7 out of 10. They're pretty strong and consistent. I rank their revenue 7 out of 10. It's also strong and consistent, and they have really solid ratios. I rank them 8 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.